Hey, and welcome to The Office Field Guide. My name's Chris, and I'm reviewing every episode of The Office ever. And today, we're looking at Lecture Circuit Part 1 and Part 2. <laughs> uh, seriously, I am on a lecture circuit. Lecture Circuit was written by Mindy Kaling and directed by Ken Quapis, both veterans at these roles by this point five seasons in. Lecture Circuit, as I mentioned, is a two-parter with part one airing on February 5th, 2009 and part two airing a week later. Part one was viewed by 8.4 million people and 8.7 million tuned in for the following week's wrap up. And to make it easy, both part one and part two have an 8.2 out of 10 on IMDb. Though the B plot arcs don't persist across both episodes, I'll be handling both of these as though it was an hour long episode. So your lecture circuit trivia is, what is the name of the very bad cat? Bad cat, that is very bad. You stop it right now. All right, as always, I run comment contests in these videos, answer the trivia first, spot out the Easter egg, and or leave the best emoji sequence summing up next week's episode and you'll get your name in that video. And be warned, there's gonna be spoilers for the series ahead. And with that, let's get theatrical. Would a liar bring Minnie Mounds bars? I understand nothing. I think Lecture Circuit was an interesting choice for a follow-up to Stress Relief. Well, that goes without saying. I'm gonna say it anyway. It seems to be an attempt to draw new viewers back to the weird but realistic world of The Office, one in which Michael Scott can bring weapons to a lecture and these types of antics don't get you fired. Cutting down the competition. Interestingly on that point, I do think that this is a nod to the UK version of The Office, with David Brent having a similar opportunity to speak to a group of people and having Dawn carry his luggage for him. This is a new cardigan. Kind of blech. Maybe you could tie it around your waist or lose the shirt underneath or something. No. Huh? can't help but wonder if this was intentional, as with the repiloting of the show, this gives new and old fans alike a callback to the original source of inspiration, and that was probably a good call. Too excited to sleep. Past that, let's talk about the extras in this episode. I have an amazing mnemonic device by which I have now memorized all of your names. Michael's mnemonic thing is great. Shirty, Mole, Lazy Eye, Mexico, Baldy. Okay, so Baldy. He's been in a bunch of stuff, but I connected first and foremost with several casting of Ben Franklin in a few different series. That is not the real Ben Franklin. I am 99% sure. This lady in Nashua is a jack of many trades for The Office, with writing, directing, and editing several episodes of The Office. She also shows up as an actress in the finale during this meta moment. Oh, um, I just, I kind of met just everybody from The Office. <laughs> More of a cameo than an extra, but Karen is back. I'm trying to figure out the last time that you and Jim had sex. At this point, in reality, Rashida Jones had just started filming Parks and Rec, which would be airing just a few months after this episode did. And Jones would only make one more appearance in the series. Why are you singling my line out, like a million years later? Okay, the way the camera lingers on Karen's husband is kind of odd. It's like it's meant to mean something, and maybe it is. I've always interpreted it as she has a type. Jim, you're 6'11" and you weigh 90 pounds, Gumby has a better body than you. Boom, roasted. But her husband in these photos is portrayed by Dan Gore, who is a producer show writer for Parks and Rec and Brooklyn Nine-Nine. He's also credited as a bar attendee in Threat Level Midnight, and I'm not really sure who he is. Maybe he's this guy, but I'm not really sure. This is probably as good of time as any to say that at this point, Daniels and Michael Schur had relatively moved on from The Office to go start on Parks. While Daniels was heavily involved in The Office throughout the entire series, his influence in the comedy kind of did wane until season nine. One thing this episode did well is return to the cringe, and there's so much of it. I'm just trying to bridge the gap between what just happened and the fact that I'm going to be doing the rest of the presentation. Andy's plotline is one such arc full of moments that I have a hard time looking at. Yours, Julia, cause I don't know how you take it, but if you rather- Poor Splenda. This moment is great though. Are you out of your damn mind? Are you out of your damn mind? Not just for standing up to Stanley, but also expressing his perceived friendship with Stanley. It's such an interesting dynamic. You bring an angel like that into this office and you don't even set me up with her. We're not friends. I didn't think about it. We are friends. But Creed gets some great moments in this one too. Have I ever steered you wrong, Jim? Wait, what? The girl that Andy likes with all of his heart is Erica Tezel, 
who played Rachel Brooks in Justified and had plenty of minor and reoccurring roles in different series. How does your boyfriend deal with your phenomenal success? And Andy goes all in, and it goes about as well as we'd expect it to. What's a nerd dog? This is the nerd dog. Whoa, what the hell? Oh. Which, I get it, he's reeling from the Angela breakup. I mean, she's not doing much better either. Is she cleaning the cat with her tongue? Oh. And that's about as much of that plot line as I'm gonna get into. I really don't get cat ownership. <sighs> Bring on the comments. Are you trying to hurt my feelings? Because if so, you are succeeding. Let's talk about Wallace's motives. And let's check the timeline here to do this. Wallace brings Michael in to see what the secret of his success is, and he gets literally nothing. It's hard to try and evaluate yourself, Michael, but I appreciate you trying. Now, I believe he knows Michael doesn't know. So Michael's branch has two costly mishaps that require corporate HR meetings. Then Wallace sends Michael on a lecture to other branches. So David Wallace has asked me to go to all the branches, except Nashua, so. I'm gonna say that Wallace is probably making up for this. Send her away, and that, that was a sucky thing to Michael. do, man. That was a Hi. really sucky thing to do. And not that he's really trying to spread Michael's approach. <sighs> this is going to be hard for me to speak today because I just learned that my father has died. No, he didn't! But that's totally open for interpretation because obviously Michael's a great boss. What about that fat guy from Stanford that I insulted? We should find him. You mean Tony. Jabba the Hutt, Pizza the Hutt. Fat guys like pizza, pepperoni pizza, pepperoni Tony. You know what, forget it. I know me. When I saw him, I would never be able to apologize to him. Too fat. But in all honesty, it might just be a poorly thought through gimmick from the writer's room to get Michael on the road to some closure. And I never got closure. And I feel like I need to go to Nashua and get closure. Okay. But that's a good place to dive into the deeper meaning. What does a bean mean? Someone please explain it to Kat. Right, so closure, what this two-parter is about. And maybe not just closure, but really kind of moving on. I think the general idea here is that when we ignore issues, they don't just go away. Kelly Kapoor spent April 1995 to December 1996 at Berks County Youth Center. Juvie. We have to make steps to try to get through them or past it. According to past employers, it in no way affects her job performance. Karen, for example, while initially shocked to hear that Jim and Pam are engaged. We're engaged? That's so great. She's actually easily able to move past that once she shakes it off and remembers that she's happily married with a kid on the way. Pam's able to move past this awkward experience knowing that Karen is doing okay and that there's no more bad blood between them. Cause I'll never wonder ever again if I did something wrong. And then we get to see the idea that Michael's obviously stuck from this traumatic ride and this episode serves as a way to try to progress him forward. What did it say? I can't tell you specifically, but it's not over. You sure? I think one of the reasons that Kelly is so hard on Jim and Dwight is that they just went through this whole thing a few months ago. But you know what? I did it because you guys didn't come to my party and you said you would try to and then you didn't even show up and so you're bad friends. So she's already hung up on the fact that they don't care about her. Screw you guys, you're dead to me. If you say screw you one more time. Yeah, screw I'm... you, Beef. Oh, I didn't forget guys, your birthday. Guys, I would guys, never oh, do that. Guys. Hey! And with Jim and Dwight, though they screw up a lot, one of the things I've always appreciated about this episode is that while Jim is constantly smudge and arrogant. I think you mean smug. Arrogance. And Dwight is constantly Dwight. Neither of them are written to be right. Why have you chosen brown and gray balloons? They match the carpet. What is that? It is your birthday period. It's a statement of fact. Have you collected the money from everyone? I am working on it. How much do you have? Six dollars. That's how much you and I contributed! Damn it, Jim! I said I was working on it. It's only when they work together that they're able to pull off some closure. I love it. Oh! Yes! Okay, good. So what's it gonna be, Kapoor? Ooh. The same goes for Michael and Pam. I feel great. So good to have closure. Ah! The same also goes for Angela and Princess Lady. <laughs> it's disgusting. So the message here is that people help people get through tough times. And look, moving on and closure can look a variety of ways for a variety of people and a variety of situations. But you know, be cautious about who you have in your corner. 
While everyone works together, Stanley, knowing that Andy's about to ruin a client relationship, doesn't talk Andy out of this. You really like her, huh? Yeah, I really like her with all my heart. Maybe he knew it'd be impossible. Instead, he trades two clients for her. Give me two clients for her. And Creed, well, I'm not really sure anybody should be taking love advice from Creed. In her room, she totally looks up. I, I say no more. So, this is how I got Squeaky from. No small talk. Just show her who's the boss. With that, let's rate this thing. This is the worst! <laughs> okay, so the cold opening. This is a really good idea but I'm not really sure it executes on the premise. Hello, doctor. I was just following up about my mole again. But overall, I give it a two out of five. It's just not very good, especially when considering that this was directly after this cold opening. See what I mean about redefining viewer expectations? This cold opening would make sense in season two, but now in a post stress relief era, it's just not fantastic enough. As for this episode, I'm gonna give it a three out of five. Hour Longs and Me have a weird history. It's hard to pull off, and in this case, they split it up between two episodes. It was awful. I hated it. I, I wanted to quit, but... Please, come on. I'm going through something. And in a lot of ways, it's kind of a great episode. Carell's acting is top-notch. <laughs> the amount of times I wrote great fill-in-the-blank character moment in my notes was abnormally high with Andy is the ultimate smackdown between the nard dog and crippling despair, loneliness, and depression. Pam. Yeah, screw him, let's do this. Jim. We looked at fossils all day. And at the end of the day, he got me a little plastic triceratops. It was awesome. Dwight. Any happy returns. Also, this one does lean into the cringe. But if you need to get in touch with her immediately, you could talk to AJ. He's a salesman here. AJ. Yeah, he's her boyfriend. He's just over there. And it also returns to Michael drama for a trip down memory lane, literally because the copier's locked. We got something far better. Their crown jewel. Their industrial copier. Oh! Oh! My hip bone! We're wedged between the copier and the railing! Well, the episode is probably attempting to introduce this drama between Michael and Holly to the new viewers after the Super Bowl. For me, it's a reminder that it was just the writing that drove Holly away. And that makes this feel so much more forced than it needs to. You remember Holly? She used to work for HR. So it's good and it's bad. I'm giving it a three out of five and I'm moving on with my life. Closure. But that's just what I think about Lecture Circuit. What are your thoughts? I wanna hear from you in the comments. Don't forget about the comment contest, including the emoji sequence for next week's episode. On Cupid's birthday. Yeah. Don't forget, if you want to get your mini review and for that episode, hop on over to the Patreon page, become a member of Kevin and the Zits, or join the Inner Circle. Both tiers let you submit a mini review for those episodes, so stay tuned for that right after this. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time.